Mm. So day, I believe it's 87. Um, I sometimes have to check the count afterwards, but anyway, day 87 of 100 days of visibility. Mm. And this morning, um, well, for the last, uh, um, last week, I've been slowly reading through a book on uh, a very clear introduction to Eastern Buddhist Tantra. The word uh, Tantra has uh, come to refer to sexual practices. And my impression is that a bunch of those sexual practices really were part of <clears throat> the original Tantra discipline. But it's, um, <laughs> in some sense, it's meant as expert mode. The uh, <coughs> throat suddenly having a little difficulty there. Um, Tantra is a, a kind of lightning path, a, 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 an extra energized, supposed to be super fast but um, but precarious pathway to enlightenment. In contrast to a focus that is the vessel based on sutras. Um, one way to let me, let me slow down here. Going into the head. Lots of energy going into the head. I have a lot of energy in my body right now. I'm uh, uh, getting a handle, just starting to get a handle on how to build that energy and hold it so that it doesn't vent into my head or out into some kind of spontaneous uh, urge. Instead is held as energy. That can be directed. So, um, in uh, uh, in a little under half an hour, I'm going to be giving a presentation, well, leading a discussion on the Stoa, on the saving the world, part two. So, I'm wanting to um, keep this relatively short. <laughs> so, I often make these about half an hour long, but sometimes uh, a, um, an hour or so. And I wanted to make today's uh, short enough that I have a gap between the two. So, um, the the basic difference, as I understand it, between the classic sutrayana approach and tantrayana is that the sutrayana approach. And this is the classic thing that we hear about with Buddhism. The idea is to recognize desires. And any form of, of, of grasping or aversion, any kind of pulling towards or pushing away, and let go of them. And to focus on the letting go, and particularly of learning to do this with desires, because desires can lead to very unskillful states of being. Um, so um, there's a lot of, um, it's a lot of parallel with uh, Protestant ideas of how to do spirituality well. You notice what areas of things are dangerous for you in terms of encouraging a type of intense desire, and you choose to let go of those. You might expose yourself in little bits, but the purpose of exposing yourself in little bits is um, like to expose yourself to the temptation is to release attachment to the desire. And the same thing for aversions as well. So you'll, um, uh, like a lot of death meditations are based on this. You focus on the, um, on the, the there's a corpse meditation where you, you'd you go to where there's a body. It's hard to do this these days because laws have made understanding death almost illegal. <laughs> um, but the, um, the idea would be that you would sit in front of corpse and focus on it and notice this body will be like that. And you hold the truth of that and you grapple with the truth of it, which is meant to create um, non-attachment with the body uh, and with all form. Um, and that might actually be the same between the two. Both of them practice a degree of non-attachment. The Sutrayana approach puts a huge emphasis on non-attachment and learning to avoid and be very careful of the poisons of the mind and learning to have a pure mind and be very skillful. Tantra 
puts all of the emphasis on uh, once you have a baseline so that you can hold this kind of power, using desire to fuel the process of awakening. I'm going to make no attempt to define awakening in this theoretically short video. <laughs> um, I'll just say that I've seen enough to know that, oh yeah, that's, that is a good thing to cultivate. Um, but with Tantra, I don't know exactly how this works mechanically, and this is part of why I'm reading through the book. It feels like, oh, Tantra may be super applicable to how I do what I do. Arguably, I've been practicing Tantra without knowing what I'm doing. Um, the idea there is something like stirring desire, using the fuel of desire, coming into intimate contact with it, so that unlike the Sutrayana approach, when I encounter desire, it, rather than it invoking attachment, it can actually burn away the attachment and bring me closer in touch with bliss of being. So there's a uh, living in the world quality to it. It's just um, a lot uh, trickier. Uh, there's a kind of uh, instability to the uh, to Tantrayana. And it comes with uh, three prerequisites. I won't go through the prerequisites in a lot of detail. There was one that really caught my attention. Um, I uh, read about it earlier this morning. I've been staring at this going, look, I've encountered this thing before, bodhicitta, um, the heart of a bodhisattva, the, the cultivation of, or, or rather bodhicitta is the accomplishment of the spontaneous desire to awaken for the benefit of all beings. Well, this puts a kind of, um, this is in contrast to awakening in order to create my own freedom. And as I was reading this book, I'm caught with, and I think the, the book is called something like a Introduction to Tantra. It's written about uh, uh, half a century ago. So the, the, the feeling of puzzlement is that as far as I can feel, I can only want to do things that benefit me. I can play with me, like what me means. But, uh, and, and maybe that's a big part of the point, that there is a... Uh, I can certainly imagine there's a there's a type of shift that I realized about a year ago <clears throat> where um, the uh, the the healthy unit of self for the human race is actually the human race not the individual we are something more like ants in an ant colony or cells in a superorganism um, that isn't to say that we should act like ants in an ant colony but rather our role in existence, in all of existence, is less like a spider, where the spider is operating on its own, uh, less like a snake, less like um, a cat, although cats are more social than we tend to uh, acknowledge, but, and a lot more like... <laughs> um, components of a larger system. Our, our ability to speak language comes from our interactions with others. The ideas that possess us, that, um, that we hold to, that shape our lives, come from the surroundings. That's a bit like the... Um, the like, today, you can't... Like, it's, I didn't make this cup. I didn't create the tea bag. I didn't uh, design the energy system that allowed me to heat the kettle that would put water in there. I didn't design the system that allowed the water to flow. All of this I am a beneficiary of. And as a beneficiary, I can do things that aren't that. If I'm doing them just for me, there's a way where I'm sort of a pulling on the resources of the whole system. Um, there's this uh, classic example. It's usually used as a form of guilt, but it is, in this case, I just mean it as an honest recognition that here I am 
using these devices, I'm using the computer here, a laptop, that I'm given to understand are mostly constructed through forced labor, often child labor, in third world countries. I'm a little confused about whether it's also in China. Um, some details about that I'm a little confused about, which is not too surprising. If it were happening in China uh, and it were to look bad, this is not okay by Chinese culture for people to admit because that is a violation of face. Um, so it's hard to find out what's true on the inside of China, and it's hard for culture to um, which is part of the culture. So the um, so the the natural unit of care actually isn't this individual. If I actually really care for me, I'm just selfishly interested, and I connect the dots, there's a natural expansion of seeing that is, well, how do I care for the system that allows me to have water? How do I care for the system that allows me to have internet? I seem to enjoy the internet. How do I care for the quality of the internet? for my own sake. So there's a way where even if I focus just purely on entirely being selfish, it naturally extends to care for really the entire species. I mean, what I read about, oh, and, and there's, there's also a nice, um, there's, there's a nice bit of game theory, a nice bit of logic that spits out from this where the um, the result of that reasoning, like th this, is what makes psychopathy a problem. Uh, it's it's not that psychopathy is inherent evilness. Psychopathy is an inability to read certain kinds of social cues automatically, and in some cases, the inability to read entire ranges of feedback. One of the um, properties of um, full-on psychopaths is that they cannot learn from punishment which means that the social feedback mechanisms that are based on punishment and threat don't work. This is why psychopaths will often um, describe non-psychopathic people, which is pretty much everybody, as annoying. Because they just kind of get in the way and they say stupid things that they can't back up or they don't understand that the psychopath doesn't relate to <clears throat> and doesn't have the effect that the psychopath... Um, um, like, like that, that causes the communication to the psychopath to happen in the first place. So, um, the, the reason psychopathy is a problem for the psychopath is because they can't read their circumstances. They're actually cut off from the direct sensing of the pathways by which what they want is fed. One way to um, not cure psychopathy, because it, it seems like there's a, there's a basic problem having to do with being able to read certain signals, and that's a detriment no matter what. But you can use pragmatic constraint and reward to retrain psychopaths so that they recognize that there is a range of social reality that they are blind to, and that it matters to the things they care about. And you can help them to understand how to navigate culture with a bunch of rules that generally let them do a lot better. Now, they're still going to run into a lot of trouble because they don't have the intuitive emotional grip that allows them to sync smoothly with the memeplex of the whole culture. But you can get them to a point where they aren't killing people because they're annoying. <laughs> So there's something like that here where the being fully selfish and fully conscious of the implications of self-desire and self-interest results in a bigger picture that is in effect compassionate, but it is compassionate for my sake.
how do I benefit? I don't think that's the, I think that's in the right direction in, in some sense across some vectors for bodhicitta, but it's missing something. I can feel it. It's closer to this sense of, when I say self-benefit, who is the self? And this is also something I had derived about a year ago, but I'm now starting to recognize there is something here for me to embody, and I think that I don't quite understand it, despite having the game theory in my mind, which is a shift to viewing the consciousness that is coming through these eyes as being the consciousness. That I am the human race. I am the universe. And that this vessel, this Michael, is something like a sense organ and a finger, so that I can act in the world. But the I there is not Michael. Michael is a way for this system to refer to itself so that when others refer to it, it can have a conception of what they're talking about so that recursive social thinking is possible. But that's not, there, there isn't a self here. Getting that feels like it's, it's the mental echo of the wisdom version of bodhicitta. Bodhicitta feels like it's a little more subtle than that. What would it mean to choose to awaken for the sake of all beings instead of just for myself? And in particular, and this is not something the book talked about, and I did some searches for this. There's a puzzle here for me. There's a meaningful paradox, which my mind has no idea what to do with. My heart feels a glimmer of a glimmer of how to orient. And I suspect I'll get it within a month. I'll get some mental articulation of it in a month. Um, maybe sooner than that. Maybe it'll take me a day. And the puzzle is, how do I prioritize all beings? The awakening, the compassion, freedom from suffering for all beings. Like I, can, I can feel and see how that would apply a beautiful foundation for awakening. But how do I do that? There's like two, two paradoxes. Um, one is, how do I do that without falling into rescuing in the Cartman's triangle sense, in the drama triangle sense, where rescuing takes in this tone of, oh, let me help you. Oh, I'm going to save you. Oh, you poor thing. I know what to do. It's, it can validate victim roles. <clears throat> and it can, in some sense, victimize people. <laughs> in fact, a huge amount of the, the whole unsaving the world thing I'm going to be talking about in about 10-ish minutes, uh, is a lot of it is recognizing, hey, rescuing can't help anyone because it starts by invalidating the sovereignty of every individual that you're trying to supposedly help. And... Um, when seen clearly, sovereignty is the foundation of how we're able to do anything at all. All the power comes from there. So you can't rescue anyone. That's not how it works. And they don't trivialize what I'm saying there. Like there of course, there are some situations where, like if a child is, um, or, or not just a child, if anybody is standing in the middle of the road, looking down on their phone or whatever, and then a car is coming and they don't see it, and you can yell to get their attention, or maybe you just charge and knock them out of the way. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but it's extremely rare. Most of us can go an entire year without ever encountering anything like that. Most of us cannot go a year without encountering somebody acting as though they're trying to save someone in a similar way. <clears throat> um, there's another side of the paradox, but uh, I see Kai has popped in. Um, hi, Kai. Good morning. I guess it's I guess it's evening for you. Um, Kai Satala says, uh, "Random anecdote: Ari psychopathy. I know someone who's a self-identified a self-identified psychopath. 
they've told me things like, yeah, if someone gave me a million for killing you and I thought I wouldn't get caught, I'd probably do it. But in general, building positive relationships and cooperating with people pays off better. So as long as nobody gives me a million for killing you, I'll prefer that. They seem to generally behave pretty pro-socially as far as I can tell. Yeah, um, I, I, I have, I, I used to have a friend who's very, uh, very uh, much like that. Um, I don't, I don't know whether, um, um, I don't know, I, I sort of don't know whether to believe them. There's something kind of cool and a little freeing about being able to say, yeah, I'm a psychopath. And I could see someone donning that as a part of their ego, part of their um, self-narrative in order to feel some of the freedom and being able to project it out in order to um, have feel the impact on other people. Um, and uh, I, also psychopathy is something like a spectrum with a tipping point where all of the, all the traits seem to converge and, or not converge, they seem to um, synergize to result in like, full-blown psychopathy. There's, there's a rough turning point. But um, yeah, that said, um, if anybody tells me they're a psychopath and tells me things like that, I'd, I'd just trust them. <laughs> With that, uh, it means something like as long as their self-interest is extremely clear, um, like as long as you're appealing to their benefit, then you can interact with them reasonably safely. Just don't trust them. Like, bear in mind that our intuitions around trust and whom we can trust are based on an implicit background intuition that the person we're talking to feels bound by the same kinds of social rules we are. There's a basic fabric assumption going on there. And for psychopaths, that's not true. And it's not true in ways that we don't have clear intuitions for. So be really careful with trusting anybody who admits to being a psychopath with things like, I don't know, where you live. <laughs> it's probably not an active danger, but each thing that you trust them with, each piece of information or each vulnerability you offer to them, each capacity of power, um, become something that when you don't notice it's in their best interest to screw you over, you'll find yourself screwed over and they won't have remorse. Uh, and there'll be nothing stopping them. And uh, yeah, and you won't be able to use the implicit social fabric to control it. So that, that's why psychopathy is dangerous for people who aren't psychopaths. Because we have very broken intuitions about how to interact with them. Um, we even try to shame them. You monster! But they don't care. <laughs> like, so the intuitions are so broken around, you psychopath, which is like either it will hurt, meaning that they're not a psychopath, so you've just hurt somebody who isn't a psychopath with the accusation, or they are a psychopath and they can't feel remorse or bad about being a psychopath, and like, okay, they're swearing at me, now how do I account for this to get what I want? So <laughs> like, it, the, the insult psychopath makes zero sense, well, except for the fact that it's used and everything makes sense, but... So um, the, the other thing I want to wrap up with, one of the question marks I'm sitting with, actually comes from Jewish Kabbalah. Um, there's, a, um, uh, there's a challenge about uh, navigating egoism. And this morning I recognized, oh, when I'm paying attention to this question of how do I prefer to awaken for the sake of all beings instead of just for me? How do I do things for other beings instead of just for me? There's a very specific sensation in the heart that I can track, the sensation of egoism. And it's enormously subtle. If I allow any of this to go to my mind, I come up with this question, well, but if I'm self-interested, how do I get to the place where I want to want to do awaken for the sake of other beings instead of just for me. Won't I be doing that because it's a faster path for me to become liberated? It seems like it's all rooted in self-interest. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the uh, Kabbalistic answer is, yeah, you're screwed on that fact. Oh, what happens is after a while you start to notice that egoism, focus on self, creates a kind of suffering for you. And so even in terms of self-interest, self-interest doesn't work. 
And so there is a need for something that is outside of the parameters of egoism to step in. A sincere prayer, a desire from the heart to be free of egoism, is what allows the first step. So that's the logic. I'm feeling something like a glimmer of that. And there's something like a fear and excitement in my heart about that. Um, I've tasted this before, and uh, it's been too much power for my heart to take. It feels like almost like my heart itself in my chest is a battery, um, or maybe a, um, a wire or something, like said, some sort of channel for power. And when I let too much power go through, it'll snap over to rescuing, or it'll snap over, it'll snap closed, like, oh, this is too much, or um, I'll, become, I'll shut off the, the ability to deal with psychopaths. <laughs> And I'll just kind of orient in like there's some sort of venting of the energy. But I'm starting to feel what it would mean to stabilize the energy so that I can reliably come from something that is more about supporting others. I'm still confused about how not to slide into rescuing. And it's okay. I'm not I'm not even asking. I'm noting, oh, I have a confusion here. It's sort of like my body figuring out how to do a new movement. So I'm pretty excited by that. Okay. So um, that's it. I'm going to switch gears. Um, yeah, thank you for listening.